Okay. Welcome, comadres and friends. I'm Nora de Hoyos Comstock, national and international founder of Las Comadres and Friends National Latino Book Club. The book club's leadership team and I are pleased to have you join us tonight for the teleconference. We're interviewing authors Ishta Maya Murray and Alicia Salazar in English first, and they're gonna be followed by an interview of Maria Jose Ferrada in Spanish. But before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping notes. Please keep yourselves on mute. You can keep your video on if you prefer. We suggest you put yourself on speaker mode, but gallery works just as well. Speaker just makes the, in the individual talking larger on your screen. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. First, let's start with our book club's history. Comadre Tess. You're on mute. Lo siento, lo siento. Okay. Um, our first book club gathering was in July 2004 in New York in Comadre Maria Ferrer's apartment. After our hiatus, Nora Comstock re-envisioned and relaunched the book club nationwide to promote the work of Latino authors to every book club lover to bring our community to bookstores and to support our writers. We started these teleconferences in October of 2006. We are in our 14th year of sharing works by Latino authors with all of you. We created the teleconferences and book club to entice everyone to read more Latino authors, to learn about Latino roots and different perspectives on Latino, Latino culture and heritage. Our book club and teleconferences are open to all, not just Latinos. We are creating a space for everyone to explore the Latino writer's mind and soul as portrayed through the written word. We encourage you to join our local book club in the city of your or time zone. We have clubs in 12 cities that are meeting virtually. There is sure to be one that can fit your schedule. If your city doesn't have one, why not help us start one? For more information about our book club, visit our website at latinolit.com. So please invite others to join us. Comadre Karen. Welcome, comadres and friends, to our December 2021 Zoom teleconference. I'm Karen Gonzalez, Assistant Coordinator for the Las Comadres and Friends Book Club. Denver Comadres Book Club facilitator and co-founder of the Colorado Alliance of Latino Mentors and Authors. Thank you for joining us tonight. We will begin with our interview of author Ixta Maya Murray. Ixta Maya Murray is a writer and law professor. Her novels include The Good Girl's Guide to Getting Kidnapped, The King's Gold, and her new book, Art is Everything. Her fiction has appeared in numerous publications, including the Los Angeles Review of Books. She has won a Weeding Writers Award, an Art Writers Grant, and she was a finalist for the ASME Award in Fiction. Interviewing her will be Maria Ferrar, Project Manager of Las Comadres and Friends Book Club and an avid reader of Latino literature. Comadre Maria, take it away. Hi, good evening. Ixa, you're on mute. Karen, thank you so much for that introduction. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Ixa, we thank you for joining us tonight and congratulations on your new novel, Art is Everything. Thank you. Um, for those who have not um, read the book or have not finished the book, <laughs> can you give us a brief synopsis of the book and introduce us to Amanda Ruiz? Yes, thank you. Uh, so the book is about, um, uh, um, a Latina artist living in Los Angeles. She's a performance artist and a conceptualist, which has this very expansive meaning. Basically, whatever she dreams up is art, which is kind of related to the title. But she has, um, she's pretty successful as a young artist. And then when she starts to hit middle age, her life falls apart and uh, she stops being able uh, to make art. 
And so it's about her journey back to trying to reclaim her identity as an artist. Yes. Now I found Amanda to be very, um, <laughs> she's like, she's like a little dynamo, a little fiery dynamo. There you you know, she's <laughs> always doing something. She's always inspired by something, yeah. you know, as I was reading, you know, because it seems like, um, every chapter, you know, the whole book is like a, a, a treasure trove of these unknown artists yeah. that I had never heard of, but that made such incredible art. Yeah. So, you know, so it's like a, it, it, it's like a, my own art gallery there. Um, and she's very feisty and she's always in her art. Um, and she's a, an art critic. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I know that you're, you're an art critic as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And do you, is Amanda a little bit of you? I mean, how yes. much of you is Amanda? Yes, yes, yes. Amanda is deaf. So I'm not a performance artist or a conceptualist. I'm a novelist, uh, as you know. Uh, but yes, I had stopped writing fiction for about nine years. And um, uh, this was definitely about my journey back to making um, uh, literature. And uh, the, I found, so this character, Amanda, uh, is uh, like so many artists, so many female artists, she, she doesn't have a gallery. Uh, she uh, barely makes any money. She's um, stringing together uh, her income from grant to grant. For a time, she has the financial support of her uh, girlfriend, um, but her, we, you know, not her wife, but her girlfriend, they don't, they, they break, they break up. Uh, so they don't stay together. Um, but she's, her life is very precarious. And, um, but she keeps on drawing strength from the history of women artists and women artists of color in particular, who have had to work so hard to avoid being completely erased. Uh, and forgotten and to keep their practices alive. And so obviously I was, I mean, I, so I went through a, uh, an illness at, that was my um, gate back to making art because um, I, was, I was in recovery for about a year. So it was one of those really big things that sometimes we go through. And uh, I reached the point where I realized you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose. Uh, you should just start making literature again. And that, that kind of desperation and uh, hunger for creativity and hunger for art is, is definitely reflected in, in the character. Yes, yes. I can see that hunger in her and everything. Um, I have other questions to ask about her art. But one thing that I found very curious is when Amanda talks about writing versus you know, she sees writing as um, yeah. as for lunatics, you know, to quote Amanda, writing is for lunatics. Yeah, right. And she finds that writing is very limiting. Yeah. In her view, it's very limiting because it's limited to, to the page, yeah. you know, to the digital space, as she says. Yeah. Whereas art, you know, Amanda feels that an art, an artist is, you know, Yes, they have words, but those words can be spray painted, you know, across Wall Street or the art is, you know, um, something that she does on her fire escape, you know, or mm -hmm. some, you know, or dancing naked through the streets right. and stuff. So, um, so she, so is this, is this sort of like your conscience kicking your butt and telling you to get back to writing? Was that what that was? Well, um, it's, it's about a couple of things. It, it is about, um, once you stop making art, you start wondering what art is and it, is it just an intention? Is it, it, can it be anything that you do? I mean, does it have to have um, corporate or professional uh, validation? Um, what, what exactly are we talking about here? And that's a critical question to ask if you want to have a, a lengthy uh, practice of art uh, to find meaning uh, in things that don't necessarily get recognized. 
and to take chances and to take risks. And this, this book, as we were kind of talking about before, you're describing this as kind of radical. It was a big risk for me to write in this very different way. So it is an affirmation that um, a person can be an artist even though no one is paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also about the interesting relationship that I think that writers have to visual artists in particular, but also uh, performance artists. I think a lot of writers that I know are, are jealous of painters uh, and of actors who hang out in groups and have music playing and are looking at beautiful things as opposed to just, uh, you know, <laughs> just sitting there at your computer uh, for five, seven hours a day on a good writing day. Um, uh, so part of it was about that. She sees writing definitely as an also ran career, as something inferior, something more limiting. And um, I do, uh, I, I I see that being a like a painter or a performer would be uh, a great way, a great lifestyle, but I can't paint. Um, so um, uh, it was just about that, just that recognition. Mm -hmm. Yes, because like like the title of your book, you know, the art is everything. So in in um, you know, Amanda keeps stressing that she is a performance artist mm -hmm. you know so that the art is fluid the art is flexible the mm -hmm. art is you know my spilling this water right. is can be an art right. you know the string in the museum you know right. the string only in the in that big room in the museum is art right. and stuff whereas your book yeah, it's very nice, you know, but it's going to sit on a shelf. It's not going anywhere. It's not, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it is going to go places. She winds up becoming a writer. Yes. So so it's kind of funny because she becomes what I do. Um, and she's struggling against it because she misses the liberty and the freedom and the elasticity of these other art forms. Um, but but yeah, I think it's a it's a wonderful way to to live, to think that teaching is art. And talking is art. And um, clean, you know, there are these performance artists. Uh, there's this one performance artist who cleans her house, uh, or a couple of them <laughs> clean their house is art. Imagine what that must look like, right? You, you walk I need the them kitchen, to come visit me. <laughs> walk in the kitchen. What are they doing exactly? So, I mean, what a, what a magical uh, and, and maybe painful way to live, but it just, it was, it was such a journey for me. It was such a, an adventure to, to move into this world of, of these artists and look at the world the way they do with everything as being full of possibility, ripe, uh, with beauty, you know, instead of, uh, I have to create this product, uh, that, um, a publisher, uh, is going to accept that it has a kind of uh, storyline or an arc or a sympathetic character uh, that is going to be palatable for a publishing house. But there are other ways of, of being an artist and it's nice to move in and out of those different mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, your book, um, even though Amanda complains about the book being limited, your book is actually very much an art form mm -hmm. because Yours is not a regular book. I mean, yes, you have chapters and each chapter has um, a title and each chapter starts with, you know, a little Wikipedia quote, but your chapters are different because it's like one paragraph is an essay and the next one is, is a diary entry and the next one is a text and the next one is, is, is a summary page and one chapter is, is one page and one chapter is 12 pages. So this, you know, that um, flexibility, that, um, that um, fluidness, you know, that right there, you're making Amanda proud. That's <laughs> Maria, you're just you're you're making me so thrilled with these questions and your generosity. Um, yes, it's they they are in the form of s. There are some essays. There are a lot of essays yes. in in the book, um, which is how she starts developing her craft as an art critic and as an arts uh, writer. 
And I also, you know, I was made to think about Audre Lorde um, who said that poetry, I believe it was Lorde who said that poetry was a really a great um, medium for women of color because you, you would be more able to perhaps be able to get the time to make, to make a poem as opposed to something like a novel, which requires practically like real estate, a salary um, and this extended time uh, that a lot of women of color, mothers, you know, parents may not be able to, to get access to. And so I found these shorter forms um, to be uh, within, you know, I was disabled. And so uh, I found it a really great um, uh, uh, mode to write in when you have limited resources and limited energy. And then and the, the, the essays get longer and longer through the book as my character grows more confident in her writing and as I physically healed and no longer became, no longer was disabled, you know, I was able to move out of that difficult experience. And so, yeah, I really, I really do, I, I really treasured the experience and what, how I was able uh, to connect with this, with this character. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other themes that we definitely have to dis discuss is this family work balance. I think um, a major fear from the very beginning is Amanda, Amanda loves art. Amanda is art. Right. Okay. She is her art. <laughs> and so she has this fear about becoming a mother. Yeah. You know, I mean, I noticed that you did not discuss her mother. I think her mother is mentioned in one sentence when you talk mm -hmm. about what her mother died of. And then that's it. Mm -hmm. So her mother was always, you know, her mother is absent from the start. Yeah. So and, and, you know, and we have this, this is what you grow up. This is what little girls are taught. You know, you have to be, you know, the, the, the caregiver, the mother, the, the, the nurturer and whatever, and your passions are secondary, mm -hmm. you know? And then if you're concentrating and giving to everyone else, what do you have left for yourself and for your passion? In Amanda's case, it's art. So, um, you know, at the end, she does find sort of a, a, a family work balance. But um, is this something that you were struggling with? Are you a mother? I, I'm not a mother, but um, I, I, I have a, well, I've had to, I've had to handle some baggage that's taken a lot of, like I'm, I've been alluding to, that's been, that's taken a lot of time. And I, and I also, um, I never, well, uh, I still have this job, which I love and which keeps me financially um, alive. And so, I mean, I've written in the bathroom, uh, it, like we all have, I mean, like I think many of us have, I've, you know, written in a closet. I've, I've, I've set the timer for 20 minutes, just trying to get something down. And so uh, that is something that I do uh, identify with with my character, uh, but she's also wondering if uh, you know um, running around the apartment naked after her son is 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 art. I mean, she's she hasn't been able to workshop it. She's not getting a Guggenheim for you know uh, scrubbing the floor while her her son is throwing things all over the house, but she's, she's saying to herself, this can, this is still art, the little things that I'm doing. So it's just, it's really her intention and, and her, and her commitment. Um, uh, and then she's just, she's just kind of hammering away at her computer, you know, three o'clock in the morning uh, when her son's asleep. So I do, I, I don't understand, I, I, I have not gone through the experience of being a mother and trying to write at the same time, uh, but I have, um, I have experienced um, pressures in my life that made it seem as if my, I would never be able to write again. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, we're running short on time. So I have just two more questions. Um, one of the things, one sentence that struck me at the very start of the book, 
mm -hmm. um, was from Laura Aguilar. You were talking a lot about Laura Aguilar. And I think that her, the sentence is the very heart of your book. Mm -hmm. um, it says, how do the bridges get built if the doors are closed to your voice and your vision? Yeah. And that resonated with me because, you know, Latinos and people of color, um, right now, you know that we have been struggling for the past, you know, I would say five, 10 years, well, forever, but noticeably for the past five years about that publishers are not publishing Latino, you know, stories. And when they publish Latino stories, it's a white person that's writing it, yeah. you know, instead of coming to the source, they're, they're handing it over to like a third party yeah. and stuff. So you know, how do you think that we're doing in this fight? And do you think that there will ever be some sort of victory for us? Are we so, building a bridge? We we are. And work like yours is, is so critical to this movement. I mean, nothing will happen except that there are meetings and organizations like yours. And, and you know that, which is why I know you've put all of this incredible energy and, and love into this beautiful group. But just your mention of Laura Aguilar, I mean, this, is, this was a large bodied lesbian Chicana from Los Angeles and she was a photographer, she was self-taught and uh, she didn't have a gallery. She didn't have, at, at the beginning, she just had a couple of friends um, Willie Middledorf, or, or I, actually, I can't remember his name. She had a couple of friends who really believed in her. Um, and I think she also had a difficult, I've, I've actually read her letters at the Stanford, at Stanford University Library, and she's kind of a difficult person, um, personally. And she just, she just didn't have the support. But in her letters, she would say, I am an artist. I will always be an artist. I believe in myself. I believe in my art. And I've never forgotten reading those letters of hers, but she would, she would make these photographs where she would stand on a corner holding signs that says, we'll work for access. And she, and she had dyslexia. And so she wasn't able to write uh, everything perfectly, but it meant like, I will, I will make photographs if you just, if you just look at them. And, um, th and now she's dead. And in the year of her death, she ascended in the art world. So what I say, what the goal is, is that maybe we don't have to die first. Uh, and <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, I think that uh, they're all, every five or 10 or 20 years, it's the year of the Latino, it's the year of the Latina on Newsweek or something. So we're used to this, we're being, used to be kind of a flavor of the month and then flash in the pan. Uh, but I think that uh, the community itself is so strong and so and so protective and supportive of this work that that's the future. Okay. So my last question is, what do we? What can we expect from you next? Are you working on something new? I have an, another book, um, uh, which is about, and I'm really shifting gears. Uh, it's about. Uh, thank you for asking. It's called God Went Like That. It's uh, coming out from Northwestern in probably 2020, 2023. And it's about a real world nuclear reactor disaster uh, that occurred in Simi Valley in 1959 that people don't really know, maybe Nora does. I had never heard of it and I live half an hour away. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at the impacts of environmental catastrophes on people of color. Uh, and women. So uh, that's what it's about. So nice and light, really funny. <laughs> yes, light reading. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Ixa, for being here with us today. Maria, thank you so much. Comadre Karen. You're on mute. Okay. Our second interview tonight is with Alicia Salazar. She is a Mexican-American children's book author who has written for blogs, magazines, and education public publishers. She was once an elementary school teacher and a marine biologist. When Alicia is not dreaming up new adventures to experience, she is turning her adventures into stories for kids. 
Interviewing Alicia will be Comadre Tess Tobin, membership coordinator for Las Comadres and Friends Book Club and the Las Comadres New York City Book Club facilitator. Tess is a retired librarian and past president of Reforma. Comadre Tess, take it away. Thank you. Hi, Alicia. Hi, thank you so, for having me. It's uh, really exciting. Yeah, we're delighted to have you here tonight. And um, I don't know if every, everybody has seen her book, but this is Camilla. I don't know if the illustration is coming across. And we just happened to read the record breaking star, but I, I believe Camilla is part of a series. And, and yes. Yes, it's a four book series. Um, well, four books were in the series were published January 1st of 2021. And there are four more being published January 1st of 2022. So that's wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about Camilla and how you came about to developing her character? Well, Camilla is, uh, she's eight years old. She is Mexican American. She lives in Los Angeles and she wants to be a star. And she, um, she's willing to work. She's willing, the, the important part for me is that she's willing to work hard and she doesn't just wanna be a star to be for, just to be famous. Like right. she, she cares about her craft and she cares about working hard to develop her craft and she wants to be really good at what she does. So each book has her on a different adventure of finding a way to finding a way to become a star. Yeah, this is what I really liked about the book is that, you know, it's very down to earth. You know, she wants to be a star, but like you said, she's not looking to Hollywood or movie stars. She's just looking at everyday life. And I think that's wonderful. Um, was your experience as a teacher, was that helpful in writing these books? Definitely, because that was the age group that I taught uh, between seven and nine years old. And I think I had a good feel for how the kids, the, the kids sense of humor, the way they think, the way they look at the world. And yeah, so I, I do think it helped. Right. How, how long did it take you to, to get to this point? To get to this point uh, in writing? Yes. Uh, well, I've been writing for about eight years. And I was approached by Capstone in 2019 uh, to submit one of the, a story that I'd written. I submitted a story that I wrote about Las Mañanitas, uh, the song Las Mañanitas, and they really liked it. And they asked me if I wanted to write Camilla. So that started in 2019. It takes about a year between signing the contract and publication, a little over a year. And um, so it's been about eight years now since I started. Right. right. That's wonderful, though. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, but I mean, you're just as resilient as Camilla as but keep <laughs> on going and, you know, sticking with it. But I have to I have to tell you, my six year old granddaughter was over here this weekend and I gave her the book. She devoured it. She she's a beginning reader, but she was reading the whole thing. Um, it's lovely how you have a Spanish glossary in the front of the book and that you've interspersed a few uh, Spanish expressions. Was it hard to choose like which ones to include? Because, you know, usually the story's short, but I was just wondering how you chose, you know, to set it up that way. The stories are about 600 words, give or take. And um, I write them all in English. And then after it's been through several revisions and uh, it's about final, I go through it and I sort of try to, read it to see where she would naturally code switch into Spanish. Like what words would naturally be something that she would only know in Spanish or she would be more comfortable with in Spanish. Um, so um, that's what I do. 
That's how I decide. So that's the number of, of words in a book, a typical early reader book. Is that 600 words? Is that what they aim at? Yes, that's about what they aim at. Um, okay, great. And the book is really set up nicely. You also have a portrait of the entire family, which I think is really nice at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. um, you have a picture of the mom and the dad and this brother and, and Camilla and her pet, which, you know, kids love to look at that thing, those things, I think. And uh, like I said, my, my granddaughter, um, she skipped the glossary. And so she did ask me what the Spanish words meant. What? So I had to tell her, I had to show her the how to go back and, um, well, are you there? Oh yeah, my screen okay. changed, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so anyway, that that's I, I love the way you set it up. And then also you have a game at the back of the book. So these are, are wonderful things for this age group. Uh, did you have a lot of input on that or did you work with your editor or how did, how did that process happen? Um, I wrote, I only wrote the story. Um, okay. And I did for for Camilla the Baking Star. Um, I came up with the ojarascas. Uh, huh? Right. Uh, and but the, oh, the publishing company does the back matter. Oh, okay. But they didn't. They didn't change the story at all. That was your. That's really just from you. The story was what I wrote. Yeah. Right. Um, when I was preparing for this, I looked on Goodreads. There's a really nice review of a multilingual family. Uh, she's Mexican. I think her partner's British. And um, she was so happy to find this book. And she was also, you know, did the same thing. She read it first to her, her girls. And then she said she found the book under her daughter's pillow that she had gone back at night, the daughter, to reread the book. So I thought that was really cute. And, um, but the mom said that, you know, she was so happy to see images, you know, Mexican American images of children in, in books. And, you know, as Maria was talking before that this is so important to see ourselves in these books. So um, also you work, did you work with the illustrator too, Thais? Um, um, Cause her illustrations are lovely. I did not work. Uh, I did not work directly with her. Um, the publisher asked for my input as far as what what they look like, and um, what else. Um, yeah, they they asked for my input on some of the illustrations, uh, like. Like when in one she's, I think this is one of the new ones that's coming out in 2022, but they're making um, gorditas. And she asked me if it, they asked me things like, should it be a bowl or should it be a flat platter that, that they're using? Um, right. So they, they asked me things like that, but um, I did not ever work directly with Dice. Right, but you're, you're very lucky she did a great job. I mean, she did an awesome it worked job. out yeah. and she took yeah. your words. Okay, um, as we were talking about, um, you know, a book like this is very short, but it's simple and concise, but I think it's, it's very powerful in talking about Camilla and how resilient she is. So like I said, you wrote the story first. Do you write like more than 600 words and then have to break it down? Or, you know, it, it must be a challenge to just get the story in such a concise way. How did you, how did you handle that? Well, it's about picture book length and I've been writing picture books for like eight years now. Mm -hmm. And I on, honestly, I think I'm pretty good at hitting the, the word count, hitting the, the structure of the story and hitting the word count pretty, I get pretty close to it. Every once in a while, I do go over and I have to prune it a little bit, but mostly um, I get it right about at the right word count. Well, that's great. Um, you want to tell us about the next series? Is uh, Camilla having more adventures? Oh, yes. Yeah. She's still trying to be a star. <laughs> She's uh, going to be a video game star in one of them. Um, and she's going to be, uh, uh, I can't remember now. <laughs> I'm blanking on, on the different <laughs> stories, but she is, she is, uh, there's four, there's four more books and different ways she's trying to be a star. Great. 
And are you going to continue with Camilla or are you moving on or how do you feel um, about your next project? I'm currently writing um, four more books for 2023 for Camilla. So uh, apparently she's doing well because, because the publisher keeps asking for more. So yeah. And did, I heard you mention when we were talking earlier that maybe you're venturing into writing a YA novel? Not YA. Um, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about writing a chapter book or a middle grade novel. So I'm currently um, doing research and reading as many um, middle grade or chapter books that as I can. I just finished reading Wonder and um, and I'm looking for more good books to read. So if anybody has any suggestions. <laughs> but how is that process different to write a, a chapter book for middle grade? What do you have to put into that that'd be different from writing the Camilla series? Um, well, with a with the Camilla series, the word count is so so small that every single word you have to be careful you have to carefully curate every single word that you write um and you have to kill your darlings a lot because you have to get rid of a lot of words that don't that is just don't fit in the story or that you feel fit in the story but don't fit in the word count um with novels um you have to you you are you have to prune a lot of words too, but there's more um, leeway in the word count. Good. Um, is there any advice you'd like to give a young writer out there about your experience? My advice would be well, when I was a kid, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was seven or eight years old. Like my mom took me to the the library all the time. I was in all the reading clubs. Uh, I read lots of books and I knew I wanted to be a writer, but people told me you should get a real job. You know, you're never gonna make any money at writing. Um, and I listened to them and I did other things for most of my life, but I finally got to the point where I decided this is, this is what, uh, my heart calls out for this is this is what I'm good at this is what I want to do so I started so I went back to it and uh so my advice to young kids out there would be to not listen to the naysayers do what your heart calls for you to do you might have to get a day job and work in the evenings on writing but never quit writing Good. That's great. Um, I do have a question in the chat. Somebody wants to know, why are the series in sets of four books? Is there a reason that's, behind that? That's the publisher's decision. That's how they, that's how they publish the series. I don't know why it's four. Okay, that's good. But anyway, I have to say to everyone, it's such a lovely book. It's illustrated so nicely. You know, it's just the right side. You know, it's a it's a it's an early learner reading book, and it's just you know has all those elements. So, um, and I have to tell you, I bought the rest of this series for my granddaughter as a Christmas present. So, mm -hmm. be thank you. <laughs> but oh, anyway, awesome. um, thank you so much, Alicia. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. Good luck on your writing, and um, thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Karen. Or Maria? Hey, uh, yes, our third and final interview tonight is with Maria Jose Ferrada, joining us from Santiago, Chile. Her interview will be conducted in Spanish. Maria Jose Ferrada is an award-winning children's book author whose books have been published all over the world in multiple languages. How to Order the Universe is her first adult fiction novel. Maria Jose has been awarded numerous prizes, including the Premio Hispano Americano de Poesia para Niños, the Academia Award for the Best Book Published in Chile, and the Santiago Municipal Literature Award. 
Maria Jose is a three-time winner of the Chilean Ministry of Culture Award. Interviewing Maria Jose will be Maria de Lourdes Victoria, an author whose work has been published internationally in English and Spanish. Her third novel, La Casa de los Secretos, took second place in the Best Novel in Spanish Award at the International Latino Book Awards. Maria de Lourdes is the founder of Seattle Escribe, the largest group of Spanish-speaking writers in the Northwestern United States. Maria de Lourdes, take it away. Perdón, ahora sí? Yes. Okay. Bueno, pues buenas noches y muchas gracias en nuevo, Nora María, por la invitación. Es un honor estar aquí y muchas felicidades, eh, María José. Es uh, muy lindo conocerte. Yo vengo siguiéndote un poco desde hace tiempo. Primero que nada, muchas felicidades por el premio que acabas de recibir en la feria. ¿no? ¿Fuiste a Guadalajara? No, no pude ir a Guadalajara, lo recibí por Zoom. Virtualmente. Sí, no pude Pero igual ir. el premio es tuyo, así es de que muchísimas felicidades. Muchas y, gracias. Y te quiero comentar que eh, yo no creo en casualidades. Y curiosamente, um, la novela que yo estoy escribiendo ahorita habla sobre el barco Mexique. Y mm. yo no sabía que tú eres la autora de ese libro también. Sí, qué bonito bueno, que estás escribiendo de eso. No es el libro que vamos a leer hoy, pero para los que no están aquí, es otro libro que habla sobre los niños uh, de Morelia que viajaron en el viaje Mexic, en el barco Mexic francés. Y, y curiosamente, yo estoy escribiendo una novela y aquí María José publicó un libro con ese, sobre ese barco. Así es de que... Ya estaba, que nos íbamos a ver. Qué bien. Muy bien. Entonces, bueno, um, quizás eh, eh, voy a, a seguir el ejemplo de María y preguntarte, um, María José, para aquellas personas que no han leído el libro, ¿nos puedes dar un breve resumen de qué se trata? Oh, y antes de eso, dinos algo, aclara algo. El libro en español tiene un título, ¿verdad? Sí. Pero en inglés tiene otro. Sí. ¿Y por sí. qué no lo traducieron eh, eh, igual? ¿Por qué eh, no usaron el mismo título? Bueno, te, el, bueno, primero, gracias por la invitación, gracias por estar aquí. Eh, estoy muy contenta de estar hoy día con ustedes. Y creo que la novela en español se llama Cramp. Cramp. Yo me imagino que eso sonaba muy parecido a Trump. Y eso era un wow, problema. ¡Qué interesante! Yo me imagino, eso yo me imagino que puede haber sido un motivo. Sí, ni se me porque, ocurrió. No sé, y yo eso lo atribuí, pero ni, nunca le pregunté a la, a la editora. Pero creo que el, el, se llama Cramp porque es la marca de los productos que venden eh, el padre. Eh, un, es la historia de un padre y una hija que viajan vendiendo productos de ferretería por el, por el sur de Chile. El padre, la hija acompaña al padre cada vez más seguido hasta que inventan un sistema, al ver que la hija mejora las ventas, eh, inventan un sistema para que ella falte a la escuela, en el fondo ella adora a su padre, es, su, es un ídolo. Y, y, y por otro lado hay una madre que es una madre ausente y a medida que avanza la novela vamos entendiendo que, este, que esta ausencia tiene que ver con la tristeza del de lugar y el tiempo geográfico donde ocurre la historia, que es en el Chile de Pinochet. La niña obviamente no, no, no sabe esto, un, un niño no, no sabe de estas cosas, pero, pero estas cosas igualmente lo golpean. ¿Cómo no? Entonces, eh, un poco se trata de, de, ese, de, de cómo esta niña finalmente, como todos nosotros, está obligada a crecer y a aceptar el, el, el caos. ¿no? Y en primer, principio intenta ordenar la realidad, pues, utilizando como ejemplo el manual de, de ferretería de su padre, 
pero a medida que avanza la novela ya tiene que crecer y, y, y eso. Muy bien, sí, eh, bueno, y, y esto, ese escenario que elegiste en el medio de la dicta, dictadura de Pinochet, um, me imagino que hubieron elementos que tú utilizaste de tus propias experiencias para, para proyectar este escenario, ¿sí? Y dime algo, la ausencia de la madre, um, que es interesante, uh, ¿está relacionada de alguna manera con las ausencias durante este periodo en el escenario de Pinochet? ¿Qué nos puedes decir sobre eso? Eh... Bueno, la novela es muy autobiográfica. Bueno. Eh, eh, mi padre era vendedor viajero. Y la verdad es que yo quise hacer esta novela para contar un poco, narrar la desaparición del oficio de mi padre. Es un oficio que cuando se instala en los años 90 el sistema neoliberal en Chile, muchos de los pequeños oficios y el pequeño comercio comienza a desaparecer. Eh, y yo pude ver muy de cerca esa desaparición. Eh, junto a esa había otras desapariciones que los niños intuíamos porque siempre podíamos tomar como restos de las conversaciones, eh, pero que igualmente estaban ahí, que es la desaparición de, de los cuerpos, ¿cierto? De lo que hubo en, en dictadura. Y. Y la tristeza de la madre tiene que ver con una de esas desapariciones que, que eran doblemente difíciles porque no se nombraban. Era, era un sufrimiento silencioso, pero que además sufría la sociedad completa. Entonces, eh, eh, incluso el que no tenía un ser querido, una madre o... Son cosas que yo creo que afectan al país como si el país fuera una persona, ¿no? Hay una tristeza dando vuelta en las mesas, en, lo, en los cumpleaños, en, que aunque tratamos de, de como disimular o hablar de otra cosa, en ese tiempo nos volvimos un poco expertos en hablar de otra cosa, en desviar la conversación, en hablar del clima, en hablar de cualquier cosa para no hablar de lo que lo que nos ocupaba finalmente el, el corazón y el pensamiento. Yo me imagino que era así, yo lo viví como niña, pero claro. pude ver a mis padres, a los amigos de mis padres. Eh, y la, la, la ausencia de la madre tiene que ver con esa vida que como que se suspende por el, por el dolor y por la no... Fueron cuerpos que no se pudieron velar, no se pudieron enterrar, no se sabe qué pasó. Entonces hay un dolor que queda suspendido. Que, que, no, que no se puede procesar. Sí, y todo lo innombrable, ¿no? Además, incluyendo, y muy interesante, el tu uso de la letra capital para, para nombrar tus personajes en lugar de usar nombres completos. ¿Qué nos puedes decir sobre eso? La protagonista es M. Bueno, el libro, según leí, está dedicado a D, que es el padre, y luego todos los personajes tienen simplemente una, una letra capital en vez de un nombre. ¿Qué nos puedes decir sobre eso? Bueno, como la novela está basada en, la, en gran parte de mi biografía, sobre todo la, la parte que tiene que ver con los vendedores viajeros, eh, mm -hmm. Está muy, eh, es muy cercana a la vida real y a los amigos de mi padre. Entonces eh, yo quería como hacerles una broma, que ellos leyeran la novela y a medida que iban viendo las historias fueran, se fueran identificando. Eh, esa fue como la, la idea de la, de la letra, pero después eh, a medida que otra gente lo fue leyendo, creo que hay una interpretación que seguramente fue más inconsciente en mí al momento de escribir, que se trata de una novela en la que los personajes son totalmente prescindibles. Quiero decir que eh, a la gran historia, ¿cierto? No le importa lo que le pasa a un vendedor viajero y a una niña. Entonces no. son personajes que, que, no, que pasan, ¿no? Y la literatura creo que lo que hace 
o lo que puede hacer es, es detenerse donde el libro de historia no, no se detiene, ¿no? Claro. Con el respeto y, el, el, y la necesidad que tengo de los libros de historia. ¿no? Claro. Te, por cierto, esta fue tu primera novela para adultos, ¿verdad? Mm. ¿Y cómo fue esa transición? Porque tú venías con, con una... Eh, habiendo escrito para la literatura infantil. ¿Cómo fue esa transición y qué tanto tra, trajiste de ese otro género que estabas trabajando? Fue muy difícil porque yo estaba acostumbrada a escribir eh, libros para niños, pero además libros muy cortos, muy, muy cortos. Entonces, eh, la primera dificultad tuvo que ver con que yo no sabía hacer una novela. Me imagino que ningún escritor parte sabiendo hacer una novela, pero yo ya venía mucho tiempo escribiendo corto. Entonces, la novela yo la podía contar en muy pocas páginas. Pero quería... Eh, eso fue un... un Desafío grande, no, no, me costaba no, de, no dejarla, no re, empezar a resumir. Eh, y eh, ¿Por qué? No fue que yo tuviera una intención de hacer una novela para adultos, lo que pasó fue que los personajes eran un poco políticamente muy incorrectos, los vendedores viajeros, esa era su gracia, ser muy políticamente incorrectos, muy fumadores, muy buenos para decir garabato, Grabato, eh, groserías, como. Entonces, claro, eso no iba a funcionar en el ámbito de, lo, de los niños, ¿no? En la escuela, eso no, no, no funciona. Ajá. La niña fuma, la niña fuma desde los siete años, entonces no, eso yo sabía que no iba a funcionar, pero lo quise seguir escribiendo. Dije, no, después me voy a preocupar de que lo para quién va a ser o si va a ser, tal vez va a terminar siendo una fotocopia para los amigos de mi padre. No, no, la preocupación que tuve fue escribirlo. Y luego, claro, no busqué editor para grande porque sabía que, que no iba a poder ser para, para, para niños, pero sí la leo adolescente. Yo he ido a escuelas donde, donde la leen y creo que tiene un lenguaje muy sencillo. Yo escribo muy sencillo. Eh, porque estoy acostumbrada a escribir para niños pequeños, entonces esa sencillez yo no, no es que me, la, me pueda deshacer de eso muy fácil, y me gusta. Eh, entonces, creo que es para adultos, pero también para adolescentes, y hasta un, un niño lector también lo puede leer. Y dime algo, eh, María José, ¿por qué decidiste que tu protagonista iba a ser la niña? ¿Por qué no el padre, por decir algo? ¿Por qué no? ¿Por qué ella? ¿Por qué contar con ese punto de vista? ¿Fue una decisión premeditada o fue algo que te brotó? No, no fue premeditado, pero eh, a medida que la novela avanzaba, yo llegaba hasta la mitad y decía, y era un narrador externo que estaba mirando todo, no, no era ningún personaje, pero era muy ingenuo. Entonces, como que me di cuenta que sin que yo tomara la decisión, lo estaba narrando la niña. Así que tuve que volver para atrás y empezar todo de nuevo, ya, ya poniendo a ella como la narradora. Eh, pero a mí me interesan la, la, los narradores niños, me gusta mucho eso ese poco manejo del contexto que tienen. Y como no tienen manejo del contexto, eh, mira la realidad de una manera como muy, muy limpia, muy, como, como que son un, un muy buen espejo, creo yo, del absurdo del mundo adulto. Y, es. esa, esa, y, y entonces el lector adulto es el que va completando Exacto. lo que el niño no ve. Y en ese sentido son novelas que se escriben con un espacio, con mucho silencio también. Lo que no se cuenta pesa tanto como lo que se cuenta. Y es lo que el lector grande va completando. Sí, exacto. Por ahí leí un review eh, también que hablaba sobre esto, de todo lo que no dice la novela. Y sin embargo que ahí está. ¿no? Eh, y, y bueno, los horrores de la, de la guerra, los horrores que ocurren durante una dictadura que vi como la que viviste. ¿Qué tanto de ese tema se hablaba en tu entorno, María José? 
Ay, en mi entorno, que era, que era uh -huh. una familia de clase media, uh -huh. no vinculada directamente a la política, eh, era muy poco lo que se hablaba. Pero, como, pero había esta tensión, cuando, eh, sobre todo cuando el grupo que se juntaba era más grande, claro que había gente de un lado y de otro que, que estaba triste también. Había una tristeza en el ambiente muy, muy, muy grande. Eh, y los niños obviamente que percibíamos algo. ¿no? Eh, eh, los niños... Eh, siempre terminan percibiendo y recibiendo el impacto de estas tristezas también de los adultos. Eh, no, no se hablaba directamente también porque los niños eran, eran un poco peligrosos porque iban con el cuento donde el vecino, y tú no sabías quién era el vecino, de qué lado estaba el vecino, si el vecino iba a hacer una denuncia, si el niño iba a decir que su tío estaba hace unos días en su casa. Entonces los niños era, eran como, había que tener cuidado con los niños. Sí, es el tratar de protegerlos, ¿no? También para que no uh -huh. sufran el impacto de todo lo que está pasando en su entorno. Ahora, los niños que lo vivieron de manera más directa ya, no, no fue mi caso, digamos, yo no tengo padres desaparecidos. Sí, sí. sí. Um, platícanos en qué estás trabajando ahora. Estoy terminando un libro que se llama Diario de Japón. Eh, yo soy muy lectora de, de las, sobre todo de las mujeres japonesas, de del, las primeras escritoras japonesas de la época Heian, hace 10 siglos, que son las mujeres que tenían totalmente prohibido escribir, porque los que escribían eran los hombres, eh, y se escribía en chino, y las mujeres no podían aprender chino, entonces estas mujeres empezaron a escribir en japonés, de, en su propia lengua. Eh, cosas que para la época no fueron importantes porque era lo que escribían, lo importante era lo que escribían los hombres, pero pasó el tiempo y, se per, y lo de, de los hombres no quedó nada, porque escribían todos en chino y todos muy iguales y siguiendo un patrón que era, que era como debía ser la literatura. Y estas mujeres que escribieron de manera libre se convirtieron en la, la autora de la primera novela, no solo de Japón, sino que de la historia de la literatura. Eh, hicieron eh, un importante paso desde los diarios a las formas de ficción, entonces una literatura que por su libertad y por escribir, teniendo prohibido escribir, a mí siempre me ha apasionado mucho. Y es un libro de cómo, cómo han sido una inspiración eh, para mí y para tanta gente que las lee, las sigue leyendo después de 10 siglos. O sea que será otra novela histórica, ¿Tú, tú consideras que la novela que estamos platicando hoy, eh, Cramp, es una novela histórica? Yo creo que sí, porque es de un tiempo y de una geografía que si bien no se nombra, porque a los niños no les importa tanto las la fechas ni, la, ni el nombre de la ciudad, uh -huh. pero es de un tiempo y una geografía muy específica que sí es, es extrapolable a lamentablemente a distintas épocas de Latinoamérica, o sea, a distintos lugares de Latinoamérica y a distintas épocas también. Es como lo que hablábamos de Mexic. ¿Por qué es interesante Mexic, la historia de los niños de Morelia, que son 500 niños que fueron, eh, vivieron el exilio político desde España a México? Porque eso sigue pasando. Exactamente. Entonces, tristemente sigue pasando, ¿no? Y bien, bueno, pues creo que se nos ha acabado el tiempo, ¿verdad? Son las seis de la noche, pero um, ¿hay algo que, que quisieras decirle a tus lectores antes de concluir? No, encantada de este grupo, me encantó el nombre, como <risa> las comadres, es una cosa como muy, muy latina y un poco lo que decía Ixta, no sé si está bien pronunciado, que, que ese, la importancia de, de los grupos ¿no? para acompañarnos, para darnos fuerza, para, para en esos tiempos en que es difícil la comunidad, eh, se, se ha vuelto una cosa tan, tan bonita, importante, así que gracias por, por tener este espacio y por la invitación. Muy bien, gracias a ti. Our thanks to author Ista Maya Murray, Alicia Salazar, and Maria Jose Ferrara. 
and their publishers, Northwestern University Press, Capstone, and Tin House Books for their generous donation of books to our early registrants. And thank you as well to our interviewers for wonderful interviews. I so enjoyed them. Maria Ferrer, Tess Tobin, and Maria de Lourdes Victoria. We are so grateful for spending time with us this evening. That the sharing of perspectives and insights from each of your work and your lives, we treasure this opportunity to learn about you. And now we feel even more connected to you. We also want to thank our audience for taking the time to join us tonight. And thank you for those that submitted questions. And we'd like to thank all our volunteers without whom this book club and all the associated work would not happen. Mil gracias. And please remember to support our authors by writing a review of their books on sites like Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble, and others. Those reviews carry weight with the publishers as well as with our readers. And remember, buy books to support our authors and if your library doesn't have a book that you want to read, we'll ask them to order it. And also, please attend your virtual local book club meetings and bring a friend or two. Also, remember, it's open to everyone, men and women, and also not just Latinos. Our January books, can you believe it? 2021 is about over and 2022 is nearly here. Oh, dear Lord, please, let's make 2022 a fabulous year. And we're going to start it with books, Sea Ringed World, Sacred Stories of the Americas by Maria Garcia Esperon, and Preparatory Notes for Future Masterpiece by Maceo Montoya. Thank you all for your continued support of our book club and Latino literature. We wish you all happy holidays. Stay safe and wear your masks. Good night and always read Latino literature. Muchas gracias.